Forget everything that you've learned about your righteousness being as filthy rags. Forget about dying to yourself. These things only serve to kill your self-esteem. That's all they're going to do. They're going to rob you of that sense of self. Slap those thoughts away and tell yourself that you know better. The more you shine the spotlight on you and the less you attribute your ability to live a good life to a fake deity who couldn't even teach you how to do that in the first place, more of your thoughts will shift into places like personal responsibility, empathy, and compassion, all things that your fake God knows nothing about. Start considering whether or not you have to worry about a lot of this stuff that you were told that you should be worried about, that you should shy away from. And I think that you will find that you make better choices for the things that you're going to do than anyone else will ever make. Welcome to Unbound, a podcast for new atheists and lifetime atheists, ex evangelicals, truth seekers, and free thinkers. There is life after faith. And life here is good. It's time for a new perspective. And a better conversation. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And it's time to get unbound. Well, we hope that those of you who celebrate Christmas had a merry one. And those of you who are from other traditions and are celebrating various things at this time of year, I will once again extend a happy holidays. Happy holidays. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And tonight, I thought that it would be interesting to talk a little bit about New Year's, the origins of the New Year's celebration, how evangelicals have tried to hijack the celebration of New Year's, and the shocking truth about Auld Lang Syne. That's all happening tonight. Okay, no, it really isn't. <laughs> I was going to say. That look on your face. I said I was going for a humorous opening, Okay. <laughs> No, we're not going to talk about any of those things. What we're actually going to be talking about tonight are New Year's resolutions from the perspective of those of you who are new atheists, and I still consider myself a pretty new atheist. Yeah. Those of you who are still on the fence with this or are still evangelicals, I've got a few ideas for resolutions for you guys, too. So we're, we're going to basically do a two-parter and talk in the beginning to the new atheists in the audience and then make a few suggestions to our evangelical friends about how they can make 2021 just a little bit better for themselves, too. Right. Before we do that, just a quick appeal. It is the end of the year, and I know that money has been spent like crazy this month, and there's still plenty of people out there that don't have a whole lot to give, but just wanted to put out the appeal. You can find our Patreon account at patreon.com slash Unbound Podcast Network. If you're still in the spirit of charity and have five bucks that you don't know what to do with, then you can always throw it our way. And five bucks a month will do more for us than you realize it will. Yeah. And it will help us to do a lot of the things that have been on my New Year's resolution list for this show in particular, and also things that I want to do with this thing called the Unbound Podcast Network. And like I said a few weeks ago, I named it that because I didn't expect for this to be the only thing that we ever did. Right. And I got plenty of ideas, but what I need is time and support. What mm -hmm. we need is time and support to right. bring a lot of these things to fruition. So if you have the means and you want to help us out, great. If not, then just like I've said before, please just tell a few people about us. Tell at least one person about us this week, and especially if it's somebody that you know is going through some of the stuff that we've talked about. You can refer them to specific episodes and again, talk about us on social media, use episode content as a reinforcement for whatever it is that you're talking about. We use a lot more syllables than you really want to use in a social media post. But I think that you might actually steer a few people's thinking in the right direction by simply posting a link to an episode that means something to you. So, those are the little things that you can do. If you can help us financially, fantastic. If not, then please just spread the word Yeah. and help some more people get and stay unbound because of what you're doing to let people know that we're out there. There's plenty of people out there that need this resource that don't even know we're here. So for the last time for 2020, patreon.com slash unbound podcast network, or just yap about us a little bit. It'll help us out a lot. And with that, we're going to move Onward and upward into our last episode of 2020, where we talk about New Year's resolutions. 
So, Shell, you were talking to me a little while ago about some of the things that you've been thinking about, and they're not really the traditional New Year's resolution things. We're not talking about things like losing weight, although both of us could probably stand to. (laughs) Um, But those are the types of things that you think about instantly when you think about New Year's resolutions. But you had some interesting things to say, and I think our listeners would love to hear what we were talking about earlier. Sure. I do consider myself to be a new atheist, definitely within the last five years. And one of my resolutions is to get to know myself more. I mean, I did get a head start with Wicca. Wicca is very much a getting to know yourself better type of religion. It is. But I want to get to know myself without that qualifier, without the religious qualifier Because being religious makes you not necessarily know yourself. And I was a Christian for way longer than anything else. And being in the evangelical church, that just means that you don't really know yourself at all. No. You don't know yourself. It's not encouraged at all. It's not encouraged for you to have, you know, hobbies outside of Christianity Unless you tie Christianity into it. Well, yeah, that's the thing. When are you supposed to have time to pursue a hobby when you're in church a minimum of three times a week? And most of us, especially those of us who were more ministry minded, were in church a lot more. I've already talked about the amount of time that I spent in church just as a teenager. So, yeah, when are you supposed to get around to doing anything for you? Right. You know, when you're in church five out of seven days at least – Oh, yeah. And that was that was that was a a light week for me. That was a light week. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, You had a lot more to do in your youth group than perhaps I did in mine, just because I was only a part of the music ministry. Well, I was convinced that I was supposed to be a pastor when I was 15. So, of course, that was where a lot of that motivation came from. I figure I'm going to be spending the bulk of my life in church. So why not just get used to this being my routine? Mm hmm. So one of my resolutions was to get to know myself better. I mean, I'm 52. I should know myself. But no, that's not the case. But you can subtract a good 25 years from that. Yes. Because that's how long we spent in this thing. Yeah. So I'm in basically in my early 20s at this point. Yeah. And you know <laughs> what? Just the, the things that have happened in the last couple of years, especially in our relationship, you know, right. there's... There are things that we've gone through, decisions that we've made that have helped both of us, but more me. Let's let's just be, let's just put it out there. It's been more for me to help recapture some of the things yeah. that I felt like I had missed out on and needed to experience just from a human level to understand a lot of things about, you know, human emotion and relationships and that sort of thing. I've been exploring this part of me a lot more right. in the past year. And it has been helpful. It has helped me come around to a place where I'm a little bit happier. It was a depressing year. It was a depressing year for a lot of people. But I was depressed for a lot of reasons, some very specific and some that are still nebulous and me trying to figure things out. But for the most part, 2020 was actually a pretty decent year of discovery for the spider. Right. And you roll in with a lot of pretty drastic changes around here. Yeah. And we'll get into the specifics of that in a later episode. I've already got the cogs turning, (laughs) but I don't want to get too much into my personal life outside of evangelical experience at this point. And I definitely want to bring some people in to talk about some of these topics that I'm thinking about for next year. But I'm jumping the gun a little bit. I'm, I'm going to give you guys an idea of some of the things that we want to talk about next year. But I want to get through this. So you were right. talking about getting to know you. What do you think that's going to entail going into the next year? Um, a lot of it is going to be working on my mental health, which I think a lot of people need to do and isn't really emphasized in our culture mental health is definitely not a thing it's all about the physical i mean and i have to work on that too but mostly what i want to do is focus on my mental health on getting myself unbound from my anxiety and depression those are good things been a hard thing to deal with and that's going to be investigating meds and getting my diet under control and by diet i don't mean going on a diet 
I mean changing my eating habits. Yeah. Because the more sugar I have in my system, the more anxious and depressed I am. There there are all kinds of studies on how diet affects your your overall mental health. And you know, I've I've tried a few dietary changes to 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 try and not really circumvent, but try to put a cushion on the depression and a couple of the other things. You need to be committed to a permanent change. Right. So that's sort of what I'm getting at is kind of like I need to figure out what works for me, what makes me feel the best, and what's going to give me the outcomes that I need to see. Right. Like not being anxious all the time, not having my joints hurt constantly. Mm -hmm. Because the higher my sugar is, the more my joints and my back and everything hurts. Right. And that's diet, but, you know, it's also things that we do to our bodies without knowing that we're doing them also. You know, like I get a lot of lower back pain when I'm in situations that are particularly stressful. When there's a Mm -hmm. lot going on, I'll just wake up in the morning and my back will be killing me. And I know, I know that that's because I am unconsciously clenching things that shouldn't be clenched. I'm tightening things that shouldn't be tightened. And I still all the time find myself making fists and my fingers hurt from that. There's the uh, teeth grinding, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing that you don't even realize that you're doing. But then you recognize the effects of them. And sometimes it's easy to deal with and make it go away. And sometimes not so much. The back pain a lot of times will persist. I found that bombarding it with CBD helps a lot, <laughs> but it's still, it's a bandaid. You know, right. there, there are underlying issues that are causing these things to happen that once you deal with the underlying issues, right. it's possible. I'm not going to say that it's a given, but it's possible that you're going to see some relief. Right. I think that working on my mental health is just going to be, it's going to be my whole year. It's going to be pretty much everything in my life. Because, you know, working on food and exercise, working on the medication aspect and everything else is going to take a lot of mindfulness, which is also something I lack because of the anxiety. The anxiety will take you out of the here and now and transport you into the future where you don't know what's going on. Into the future and sometimes even into the past. Yes. Where you'll think about things that happened 20 or 30 years ago and cringe it's and like, then get depressed. This is not worth even spending the time to think about. Right. But so, your brain decides what to think about, and that's the problem. Right. So if you're not mindful, your brain can go off in a million different directions. So, you know, between me and my therapist, we've kind of dis- we've kind of discovered that mindfulness is a real problem. I need to be more mindful and not just do things because, well, it's time to do them. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. Sometimes I just eat without even thinking about it because I want to eat. Yeah, that's been an issue with me over the last year, too. I mean, I was well into this routine of eat when you're hungry, not when you're not, which was one of the mantras of the person that actually helped me lose all that weight. But, you know, that definitely goes by the wayside when you're depressed Mm -hmm. and you need just some semblance of comfort. You need something that feels good. And food that you like feels good. It feels good to eat it. It feels good to smell it. It feels good to have it. And I learned hard lessons long before I lost all that weight. I learned some very hard lessons about using food as your mode of comfort. Right. But, you know, 2020 has been a rough year. I kept a lot of that weight off for a very, very long time. And it's not like I've completely bounced back, but I bounced back more this year than I ever wanted to. And I bounced back more this year than I have in any year previous. Right. So at this point, it's imperative that certain changes happen. And it really does start with getting your head in a better space. And I I feel like I'm well on my way to to being there, to being in a better headspace and being able to suss out some of the things that have happened in not just this year, in the last couple of years, because a lot of these sources of stress and anxiety, um, they cropped up somewhere between like mid 2018 and 
the end and the end of this year. Yeah. And 2020 being the year that it was, it just <laughs> exacerbated a lot of it. Oh yeah. I found myself eating more than I ever have. For a while there I was doing pretty good, but then the isolation started to get to me and I just started eating things that felt good to eat and nothing else. Well, yeah. I mean, I still hold firm to the notion that it's better to be sitting in line at the drive through than sitting on your couch with a bottle. But I mean, they're, you're damaging your body and you're damaging your sense of self in different ways with both of those activities. I mean, I still have not gone back to fast food, particularly McDonald's, because I know the kind of comfort that I got from that food. And I know the reasons why I used to eat so much of it. Right. And I don't want to, number one, go back to my alcohol, which was the drive through And I know that I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want the food and the taste of that food to dredge up a lot of those old memories. Right. Because one bite of that Big Mac, and I know that I'm going to be remembering the reasons why I had gone so far down that particular rabbit hole. And I don't want to go there again. No. So, I mean, literally the last time I had McDonald's, and I know the date because I know when I started the diet, <laughs> I literally have not had McDonald's since May 19th, 2013. And I'm actually quite proud of the fact that it's never come back. Right. I don't eat a lot of fast food at this point. I mean, I'm, it's next to nothing. Mm -hmm. But that one particular thing is one that I know that I can never go back to. It's like the alcoholic who... Who knows that if he has that trend and this, this isn't, uh, it's not a universal truth, but many alcoholics would have a problem going back to the drink and being able to use it in a more constructive way. There's no constructive purpose as far as I can see to eating at McDonald's. It would <laughs> just put me in a headspace where all I want is McDonald's anymore. Yeah. So I just don't go back to it. And that's just that. Yeah. Honestly, when you were talking before, that was what I just jotted down in my notes was the concept of new year, new me. Well, I don't really like that phrase very much. I think that it's very cliched. I'm more of the mind of new year, no me, no with a K, yeah. new year, no me. That's a good and one. that I think is probably the best kind of resolution that you can make. You know, there are pros and cons to this. There will be people who will say that it's better to have something concrete, some kind of plan that you can follow. But I kind of like the nebulous nature of this because it leaves the door open for all kinds of things to happen right. and to be accepting of all kinds of things to happen and be okay with certain things happening, being okay with certain things not happening. And instead of just coming up with a concrete list of things that I want to change, things that I want to improve... I think that you're absolutely right. Knowing yourself and making a conscious and concerted effort to know yourself better is, if you have to make a New Year's resolution, I think it's a good one. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say as much about that because you, you touched on pretty much all the points that I would have touched on with that. And that was the phrase that ran through my head when you were talking right. earlier. New Year, know me. Get to know yourself in 2021. Definitely. And we have a bunch of of suggestions on how you can do that in our resolutions for new atheists section. But before we get right into that, I also wanted to let you guys in on some of the things that we have planned for next year and some of the topics that we are looking to explore a little bit in 2021. Now I'm going to read off this list and I'm going to also put out a call to anyone who's listening who may want to be involved in the conversation because we would love to start getting some people to tell some of their unbound stories on oh, this definitely. show. And if any of these kind of strike a chord with you, I want to hear from you. Our email address is unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com. I see this account every single day. I will know when we get an email. Just get in touch with us and let us know that you have some expertise in these areas or that you have a good story. And let's talk about getting your unbound story told because just like with the stuff that we talk about, I know that there are many, many, many people out there who have gone through things that are similar and who have had experiences that are similar to what we have. And I think that it's important that some other voices get heard, and I would love to have some new voices heard on this show. So if you and, and also if you have 
ideas for yes. future topics. So this is at the end of every episode. We haven't had any bites, but you know, if you have any ideas for things that we should be talking about, right. things that resonate with you, things that you have struggled with and you would like to see us address, by all means, let us know what those things are. We will do the legwork. We will do the research. We'll put together a, a kick-ass episode on whatever it is that you want us to talk about. So let us know what your ideas are. Here are some of the things that I've come up with for 2021. Homeschooling. And just so that we are very, very clear, homeschooling and remote learning are not the same thing. Right. And we're going to talk about homeschooling from the evangelical perspective because, I mean, it's not just evangelicals who homeschool, but some of the reasons that evangelicals have for homeschooling are just bad shit. Mm. And we're going to take a look at that. I also started thinking just when we were talking about my weight loss experience, the subject of hypnosis yeah, and whether or not that's legit. Mm. because the way that I lost that weight began with me going to see a hypnotist in 2013, and I lost a lot of weight. But did I lose the weight because I was hypnotized, or was there something else going on? I really want to tackle that topic. It's not really an evangelical thing, right. but there are definitely elements to it, like we talked about with worship music and yes. other parts of the worship experience where people can become very enthralled with what's going on around them. Faith healers and that sort of thing, they use this kind of trickery too. But that doesn't mean that hypnosis is a real thing or a legit thing, but there are a lot of gray areas and nuances, and I'd really love to take some time and just pick it apart a little bit. I've had it in my head for a while to do an episode on gospel tracts. Yes. And just the nature of a lot of these tracts and the way that some Christians choose to use them it can be pretty nefarious. Uh, yeah. I'm also looking at at least one episode and possibly a series on televangelists. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not last podcast on the left. We don't have the <laughs> research team that they have. But I think that we could pull off a couple of good episodes about either individual televangelists or just the televangelism industry. And that's what it is. It's an industry. Oh, it's an it's industry. not a ministry. It is an industry. And... I would love to just spend some time talking about some of these people and some of the methods that they use, the psychology behind the things that they do, because I'm big on the psychology of things. Christian charities, yes. talking about organizations like Goodwill and the Salvation Army and some of the other ones that may be a little bit smaller or not as well known, but have still been involved in some shit that you just really want to consider whether or not it's worth giving them your money. Right. And then this phrase jumped into my head, too. In response to Ken Ham's answers in Genesis, I started thinking about just how much toxic information yeah. there is in the book of Genesis and how it does such a good job of teaching you how not to be a good human being right. that I thought about doing at least an episode, perhaps a series called Cancers in Genesis. Uh. Um, so <laughs> you find it cringeworthy, don't it's you? It's very cringy, but it's also really accurate well let's ask the listeners if you think it's too cringy i'll come up with something else i want to talk about purity culture and i kind of have my sights set on a couple of people to approach about this one right. and get some more firsthand knowledge and information from because i can research anything but i'd much rather especially with this particular subject i would much rather have someone or a couple of people come on this show who have been through this who understand what it is and talk about it from a first-person perspective. I think that it would be very beneficial for our listeners more than me just going out and finding a bunch of articles and talking about it. I think this particular issue needs to be addressed by someone who's been there. So if that's you and you want to talk to us about it, then by all means, let me know. Missions. This one touches me personally because more than once I have had people who have told me that because of the work that I did when I was young and the influence that I had over them when they were young – it sent them to the mission field. And there's one person in particular who is very, very not happy with me because she knows that the show is out there and has voiced her disdain over the fact that I'm doing this now. Yeah. And it's like, I'm here because of you. Well, I, you're here because of me. I thought you were here. You, I thought you were there because you were called to be there. So, you know, what does that have to do with me? I mean, I understand that I played a role in it, but I didn't pack your bags. Mm. You know, I'm I'm getting better at this. I'm getting better at forgiving myself for 
getting people involved in this and getting them that deeply involved in it. It's not that I'm callous and uncaring, but with all due respect, we all have brains and we all have the capacity and responsibility to use them. And just because one of your teenage friends tells you you'd make a good missionary doesn't make it so. And it doesn't make making drastic life decisions when you're 16 and actually following through on them and spending your life doing something that if you were truly happy with it, you wouldn't be angry at a, at a podcast host for getting you involved in. Yeah. But I really want to talk about that topic from the standpoint of how it's done in a lot of evangelical circles and what it actually accomplishes. And just spoiler alert, it doesn't accomplish very much. <laughs> Christian education, not just the Bible college angle. We've already talked about our Bible college experience, but you want to talk about getting a subpar education. Most Christian schools in the United States have a reputation for being very subpar. And there was a point in time where I was considering moving from my secular high school, my public high school into a Christian high school. And even then looking at the things that I could expect to learn in this place, I said, yeah, no, I'm staying where I'm at. Yeah. Because it was good choice. It was, it was tragically bad. Mm. And I'm like, I'd be a straight A student, but you know, we're talking about doing work that was on fifth and sixth grade level when I'm in high school. Right. And I, and I knew at least at that point in time that it would be a bad idea for me to squander my intellect going to a Christian high school. I just wish that I had continued that thought when I was thinking <laughs> about going to a Christian college, but that's water under the bridge. We've been there. We've done that. Biblical eschatology, which for those not in the know is about the end times. Now we've mm. already done an episode called rapture junkies. I want to take a, a closer look at this and all the hype that has been heaped onto this subject over the years. And, you know, really, try and dissect a little bit of, of what's going on in Revelation and relate it to the things that have happened in society and not even remotely from a prophetic standpoint, but just from a hysteria standpoint. Right. Next one on my list was the blessed wait, why Jesus is never coming back. Mm. And I'd like to talk about my days as a preterist in this, uh, in this particular episode and uh, preterism is basically the belief that Jesus came back spiritually and it happened around 70 AD, blah, blah, blah. We'll get into it when we actually do that episode, but that's what that's going to be about. I want to talk about blaspheming the Holy Spirit and the whole concept of unforgivable sin and how this creates paranoia in the minds of a lot of evangelicals. It's a, it's a major, major point of fear. And I would like to set some of your evangelical minds at ease about this one eventually. Corporate Christianity, Hobby Lobby, Chick-fil-A. We want to talk about some of these major corporations and the things that they get involved in and how they sneak their doctrine into the way that they do things. And then I had the idea of going in a slightly more last podcast kind of direction with a couple of things and doing some heavier research on a couple of topics. The two that came fastest to mind for me are the Azusa Street Revival. You want to learn where the Assemblies of God came from and, and pretty much every other wonky flavor of Pentecostalism. Mm. And it was craziness. All the craziness of the Azusa Street Revival and the people who were involved. There were some very bad shit crazy people involved in that. And also, I would like to eventually do at least a subject on um, child sexual abuse in evangelical churches because... I think that uh, the spotlight has been shown on the Catholic Church pretty heavily, but right. there's very, very little that's said about the things that happen in evangelical circles. And one group in particular called Jesus People USA, whose story pisses me off to no end, because as I've said before on the show, Japuza and Cornerstone Magazine, which was their uh, is their primary publication, was the only Christian resource for a long time that I could say I actually trusted. And they'd been diddling kids for decades, literally for decades, and just sweeping all of that completely under the rug and doing what they could to protect the people who were involved in it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, guess what? It's not just for the Catholic Church anymore. Mm -hmm. And I want to do a little bit on that, at least bring them up in a topic on child sexual abuse in evangelical churches. So that's not really even an exhaustive list, but I think I've spent enough time on that for now. 
we want to get into our main topic, which we are going to do right now. So on the subject of New Year's resolutions, the first thing that I want to do here is address new atheists. And Mm -hmm. I've just got a bunch of talking points. I don't have anything terribly scripted out for this one. I just want to talk to you guys about what you can do in the next year to keep things moving in a positive direction, keep your thoughts moving in a positive direction, be happier with your life. And this really, doesn't it just go back to the whole working on you thing? Yeah. New year, know you. Well, I think that a lot of these fall under that category. So as we go, I hope that at least one of these things will resonate with you and you'll take action on them. Mm -hmm. The first one's going to be a tough one right now because of the way things are in the world. But I do think one of the key things that I think that most evangelicals struggle with. And one of the things that keeps people active in evangelical faith is the concept of community. And they don't want to lose that. They don't want to lose those connections that they've made with people. But, you know, how good are those connections when they perpetuate the kinds of thoughts and behaviors that lead to you getting around to knowing yourself? So, It's a scary thing. It's a very scary thing to think about losing that. But what I've learned through this entire process is that your real friends stick around. Mm. Your real friends accept you the way that you are. And some of your evangelical friends have the capacity to think a little bit more practically than you think they do. But you know what? That is going to be a very, very small number. I'll go right on record. It's going to be a very small number that stand by you when you leave. And given the state of the world right now, even as I was typing this out, it's like, is this good advice for the upcoming year? Well, you know, I am optimistic that things will change, that things will start to right themselves a little bit as this year goes on. And hopefully we're still not talking about COVID at the end of 2021 Mm -hmm. and social distancing and all of these things that are keeping people apart. But I think that one of the things that, new atheists need to focus on is resolving to find groups and communities where you fit in. Now, I'll add a caveat here. Be careful on social media, but there are some good groups out there. There are some decent groups on Facebook and on other social media platforms, but I'm talking more in terms of a real life kind of situation. It's important that we make friends that aren't going to be constantly steering our thoughts back into those old patterns. And and those evangelical friends that I was talking about a minute ago who accept you the way that you are, are also not terribly likely to keep proselytizing you. Right. I mean, some will, but most, if they accept where you are and where your life is going, then chances are they're going to take a live and let live approach. But I think that it's very important to find people who think the way that we do, who are involved in things that we've wanted to be involved in, but either didn't because we questioned whether or not it was sinful or whether or not it was a better use of our time than doing something with church. Well, if you take church out of the equation, you're going to have time to do some of this stuff. And I recommend when it becomes safe and when it becomes feasible that you start actively looking for people who think the way you do now And surround yourself with them and make some new connections, make some new friends. Just get into some better circles of people who are going to allow you to live your life the way that you want to live it and confirm for you that it can work because they're doing it. I think that that's very important. The next resolution that I would like you guys to consider for this year is resolving to discover some new atheist content. Because, I mean, there's all kinds of Christian content out there, and Mm. most of it is garbage. Let's just put it out there. The vast majority of it is garbage. Mm. If you've ever spent five minutes watching Pure Flicks, you know what I'm talking about. But, you know, we've already talked on a previous episode about some of our favorite podcasts Mm -hmm. and atheist resources. I just want to give a plug to a few of my favorites again. And there are a few new ones on here because I've discovered some new stuff since and and some new people since. Let me tell you, I absolutely love The Scathing Atheist. Oh, yeah. And all of the podcasts that fall under that cover, especially God Awful Movies, which we've talked about recently. Oh, yeah. But just check them out and check out their their sister 
podcasts and their half sister podcasts and the way that they they describe yeah. everything. It's all really really good content. And honestly, those guys they take the righteous anger thing to a new level. Yeah. And they talk about things in a much more blunt force way than I do, which surprises me because I have a very blunt force kind of personality. Mm. But I'm like a lovable little teddy bear <laughs> in comparison to someone like Noah Lusions. That's actually two names, Noah Lusions. Yes. And uh, and the crew that work on that show. But um, especially, especially him and the and the diatribe. Uh, let me let me tell you, I consider myself to be a pretty articulate person. Mm -hmm. I wish that I could put my thoughts together the way that, the way that he does, and fuel them so eloquently with that righteous anger. I wish that that was me. I wish that I had the balls to get behind the mic and say some of the things that he says. But you know what? I don't have to because he's already doing it. So I'll refer you to that show. Um, the How-To Heretic we've talked about before, very Mormon-centric, but they talk about a lot of topics, and their subject offerings span the gambit, and I have never been disappointed with one of their shows. They usually deal with several topics per episode, and they don't go into the kind of depth that we do with some of the stuff that we do, but they don't have to. They give you their perspective, and then they move on. I think the way that they do it and the perspectives that they bring to the table with the stuff that they talk about is really really unique and it's humorous when it needs to be it's serious when it needs to be but it's an overall good show that you guys should definitely check out if you've never heard of seth andrews please look him up he's got a, a podcast called the thinking atheist that i think every new atheist should be listening to definitely. if you want content from someone who knows what you're going through as an ex-evangelical you need to be listening to seth andrews it's just that simple then there's r and Ra who has all kinds of content out on YouTube. One of the smartest guys oh, that yeah. I have ever come across in yeah. atheist circles. His name is Aaron Ra, A-R-O-N, and last name is just Ra, like the sun god Ra, okay? <laughs> and I'm sure that that was on purpose. <laughs> it sounds yeah. just like Amon Ra, but it's not Amon, it's Aaron, A-R-O-N. And I would definitely... Absolutely, positively, especially if you want to learn a thing or two about science, yeah. definitely check out Aaron Ra. And I'll also put a little plug in for a couple of shows on Netflix by Ricky Gervais, because these aren't necessarily atheist shows, right. but you get his perspectives on a lot of things when you watch his content. And there are two series on Netflix that I think that everybody should see. One of them is called Derek, which is about an autistic adult who basically volunteers in a nursing home in Britain. And there's only, I think there's only two seasons of this show, yeah. but the content is meaty and, and tear jerking at times, but also really, really dumb, silly at times, not work safe content. I'll yeah. put that out there. There are moments. There's one character in particular in this thing that, you know, you don't really want coming up on your screen at work, no. <laughs> given what he does and what he says. Yeah. But it's a fantastic show. I definitely recommend checking it out. And then there's another one that's called Afterlife, mm -hmm. which, again, I mean, just absolutely gut-wrenching content. But it provides some really, really good perspectives on life without the quote-unquote benefit of faith. How do you think about certain things and how do you approach certain things when faith isn't part of the equation? Well, we see the main character in this show go through a lot of shit and we see him make some good decisions and good choices and we see him make some really shitty decisions and bad choices. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love the contrast there and I love that you can get a little bit more inside the mind of Ricky Gervais because I've heard him talk about all these things before, right. but in the context of narrative, it works really, really well. So look into some new content this year. I think that you're really going to enjoy the, the things that I've mentioned, and there's a lot more out there, too. Yeah. I wanted to put in a plug for my favorite uh, medical podcast called Sawbones. It's by Justin McElroy and his wife, Dr. Sydney McElroy, and they tackle either like old-timey remedies that they disprove and some like aromatherapy and essential oils and they talk about how you shouldn't eat them you shouldn't imbibe them they don't do certain things that they say they should do 
you know, they talk about all sorts of basically snake oil. Yeah. And they also talk about some other things. They take um, viewer questions sometimes or listener questions. They've had a few episodes about COVID Mm -hmm. to answer questions. And these are actual people who actually do. I mean, she's a doctor, but she also does a lot of research. So she has a lot of accurate and up to date information. That's great. You know, I don't think that I've heard of that one. Oh, it's so much fun. But, you know, now I'm going to have to check it out. You see that even the spider is going to discover some new content this year. Yeah. So thank you. The next thing that I brainstormed for you guys to uh, to add to your list of resolutions this year or to consider as a resolution for this coming year, resolve to explore things that you were told to avoid. Now, I know that as a Christian teenager, it was discouraged, but not forbidden to do things like go see secular movies. You were judged more harshly for an R-rated movie. But, you know, one of the things that I found to be really comforting about you when we first got together Mm. was how when we started actually dating and I wanted to go see a movie, I remember asking you at one point, do you have issues with an R-rated movie? And you told me that you didn't. I'm like, oh, well, good. So I'm dating an adult. That's awesome. (laughs) Um, That's definitely a good thing. If you have shied away from things like secular books or secular music. You know, for two years of my teenage life, I didn't listen to the radio. Ugh. This was in the 1980s, like the decade of pop music. Yeah, right. And I was out of the loop for like two years. I've, I've since caught up. Oh, yeah. But for about two years there, I was listening to nothing but Christian rock. So, you know, if, if you've shied away from secular music because you've been convinced that it's satanic, just like I was, you can listen to our episode on the satanic panic about that one. But, yeah, I got scared off of secular music for a while. And Christians, especially in certain circles, are really, really good at vilifying this. Word of Life was militantly anti-rock. They didn't even like Christian rock. (laughs) But by the time I learned that about them, I had also learned a few things about myself and said, okay, well, that's their opinion. There's really nothing wrong with this. But I did deprive myself of certain things. I think I always went to the movies. I always yeah. had kind of an affection. It was it was this weird this weird dichotomy mm-hmm. where the music was bad, but I allowed myself to go to the movies. Yep. And when I say the movies, I wasn't looking at the ratings. You know, I went to see the Lethal Weapon movies, I went to see the Die Hard movies, and I loved the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. I saw mm-hmm. several of those in theaters. And for whatever reason, I didn't feel like that was as big a deal as the music thing. And I think, well, you know what? Now that it's in the front of my mind, there was all of that stuff about the subliminal nature of music and the things that they were allegedly doing to the music to make it more appealing and blah, blah, blah. So I feel like the music got vilified more than movies did. I heard more commentary on music than I did on movies. But these are the types of things that a lot of churches will tell you are either flat out or no-nos or they will discourage them, or they will judge you for enjoying them. So if you're coming out of this thing, and there are movies that always looked like they were interesting for you, and you never checked them out because you were afraid it would make baby Jesus cry, this is the year. (laughs) This is the year to check out some of those movies, I think. Same thing with books. I remember having a conversation, and it's so funny because this happened in the movie Footloose, too, where... I had a conversation with someone about Kurt Vonnegut right? and the book Slaughterhouse five comes up in the movie footloose. This was about another one of his books called cat's cradle, which delves into a religion called Bokaninism, which I won't, I will not spoil any of this because I think that everybody should be reading Vonnegut. Yeah. But I caught some hell for reading Vonnegut when I was younger, but I always found his stuff fascinating. And as an adult, why by the time I was in my thirties, I had basically taken a fuck it all approach to don't read these books. Don't do that. Don't do this because I just understood that I have a mind of my own. Right. So I started exploring some of this stuff more. I've read a lot of Vonnegut and his stuff is well worth, it is well worth the read anything. Kurt Vonnegut Jr. is well worth the read. So I'll put that plug in. But, you know, we're talking about you. What resonates with you? 
have you always liked the idea of reading some Stephen King? You were afraid of picking up his books? Well, guess what? He's another good one. Pick up some of his books. Books, please, not the movies. Books. <laughs> Think books, okay? But still, anything that you had an interest in that you shied away from because you were afraid of the backlash, well, that's not a problem anymore. Start exploring some of this stuff. Start doing some stuff for you and discover some of the things that you've been missing out on because I think that's an important thing to uh, to do once you've resolved to be out of this thing. It's a good way to maintain that unbound mindset. That's what I think. We did an entire episode on getting past the concept of sin, but I think that it bears repeating as a New Year's resolution. Those of you who have struggled with things that you've been told are sinful that really didn't make any sense to you as being sinful. Well, I'm not saying go out and just start doing all this stuff, but start considering whether or not you have to worry about a lot of this stuff that you were told that you should be worried about, that you should shy away from. And I think that you will find that you make better choices for the things that you're going to do than anyone else will ever make. And it goes right back to the Wiccan read. Do what you want, but don't hurt anybody. There you go. As it harm none, do what you will. And I think that as, as a spiritual platitude, that one works in a secular setting as well. Yes. It works really, really well. Make good choices. Don't hurt anyone. That's really the bottom line with that. But stop thinking about things in terms of sin. We got an entire episode on that for you to peruse too. Resolve to at least start paying attention to your own sexuality. Oh my God, this one is so important because it's the one thing that evangelical faith will just crush out of you if you let them. Yeah. And I mean, with all due respect, I've said it before on this show, if you can get people to the point where you can control their wallets and you can control their private parts, then you've got them. Right. And that is what evangelical Christianity wants to do to you. They want you under total control. And that is what this whole thing with human sexuality within the confines of evangelical faith is all about. It has nothing to do with whether or not it's right or wrong for you to have certain impulses or to engage in certain behaviors. It has everything to do with them wanting to control whether or not you do these things, because if they can gain control over your emotions to the point where they can control what you do with your body, I mean, what else is there? Yeah. What else is there at that point? So they do a really stellar job of this. And it's a point of contention with a lot of people coming out and a lot of people coming out never reach a point where they're comfortable with their own sexuality, especially if their leanings are not 100% traditional. And that's any kind of alternative lifestyle, not just homosexuality. There are loads of alternative lifestyles out there. Oh, yeah. And if you feel like you've been playing heterosexual or you've been playing monogamous for a long, long time or any other games that people play with their own heads to try and conform to what their evangelical leaders, mentors, friends, church members would consider to be quote unquote normal or acceptable. If that's you, then it's really time to start thinking about what you want in that arena and start exploring some options. And, you know, if no one has taught you about safe sex, learn, Yeah, definitely. you know, don't, don't just go out there and start having a party without understanding what all the ramifications are, both physical and emotional for being less than responsible in that arena. If you need to get educated about what safe sex is, don't look at it as, okay, well, you know, we went over this in eighth grade health class. Well, number one, if you went to a Christian school, you probably didn't. Right. And number two, that was probably a long time ago now. And you need to relearn some of these things so that you understand what they mean to you and what your responsibilities are as an individual and toward other people when you involve them in this part of your life. So definitely get educated about that. And just as a little side note here, it's not wrong at all to be interested in things that are off on the fringes either, like specific kinks, like certain alternative lifestyles. If you feel a draw 
toward any of these things in your life, then you should definitely be exploring them. Educate yourself first before you involve oh, yeah. other people, but definitely explore them. You can find out a lot of things on the internet. Right. So the point there is that you can educate yourself before you go out there and <laughs> involve someone else in your on-the-fly education, as it were. Right. We yeah. don't want on-the-fly education. Yeah. That's... I mean, there, there, are, there are written resources there are videos, there's all kinds of content out there that will answer any question that you have about any and all things sexual or kink. Right. And I, from what I have heard from other people, most of the kink community is very open and willing to talk about these things. They want you to have a good experience. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've had some really, really good conversations with a few people just in the last couple of years on this very subject and you're absolutely right because when you enjoy something and it's kind of out there on the fringes and you know that people don't understand i think that yeah the the bdsm community right. and and communities that revolve around other various kinks right are very very open to talking about their own experiences there were things that a year ago i didn't know about but for me, I found it to be very beneficial to simply talk to people yeah. about the things that they're into and not even in the context of trying to figure out if this is something that I might want to do, but just the enthusiasm right. that people bring to the conversation when they talk right. about this stuff. I think you can benefit a lot from. And going back to the whole concept of sin, when you start interacting with people who are involved in these kinds of alternative lifestyles, once you start getting an idea of how it shapes them as people, right. it's easier to stop looking at it from the standpoint of sin. Right. Because anything that enriches you, anything that empowers you and makes you feel more you, I don't think you could right. ever look at and call sin. That's right. just me. It's like when you talk to people who are actually gay or actually lesbian, or actually anybody else that the evangelicals are terrified of. Mm -hmm. You learn that they're just people. And what they do isn't a sin, because they're doing it and they're happy. Yes, yes. And that honestly is the most important thing. Is what you are engaging in making you happy? Are the people that you are engaging in these things with making you happy? Is it a good experience? Right. Is it something that you are happy to be exploring that you are you happy that you tried this? And you know what? You can find yourself in a situation where you're not all that happy with with what you're doing. This isn't really what I thought it was going to be. These people aren't really who I thought they were. You're allowed a few mistakes along the way. Sure. And everything that you experience, you catalog and you learn more about yourself, you grow as an individual, and you start understanding what you actually want in these areas, particularly in the area of sexuality, because that is the one area of your life that I think evangelical Christianity does the biggest number on. Right. I think it's the one thing that they attack the most heavily. Right. Here's another one that I think that a lot of people coming out struggle with, and it's the concept of not believing anymore. And I remember having this conversation with my grandmother when I had my first real major crisis of faith. I remember saying out loud words to the effect of, I don't think that I believe in him anymore. And I'm scared to death because I don't know what I'm going to do without that. Well, there's a lot that you can do without that. <laughs> so this year, I think that many of many of you that are coming out of this need to resolve to not go back to your abusive ex deity. Okay, very, very early on, I think it was even episode two or three, where we talked about the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And at the very end of it, I said, get to know your daddy. Well, you need to definitely understand who and what this deity is, who and what the Hebrew Yahweh actually is. And we've talked on numerous episodes about his nature and just how it goes counter to anything that's good, moral or decent. So, as I've said before, your sense of right and wrong exceeds his by a country mile. Do not go back. When you're thinking about going to church, yeah, you know what? It's not God that you miss. It's the people. It's the experience. It's the emotionalism and the sensationalism of it. Those are the things that you miss. You don't know this God. 
he's not capable of being known, mostly because he doesn't exist. But even if he did, he wouldn't want to know you anyway. Right. That's just that's the message that runs through the entire Old Testament is that he's just a malcontent who deals with everything by killing it. Yeah. And any conflict, any problem that he sees in the world, it's like, okay, well, if we kill these people, it'll solve it. Right. And that's pretty much the way that he deals with everything. And we also, during our uh, episode on abusive relationships, we talked about a lot of the attributes of Yahweh that mirror an abusive partner. Right. So you might want to check that out too. That's as far as I'm going to get into that because we have done a lot of content on this one. But just resolve to not go back to Jesus, okay? There's no point. It didn't work for you the first time. Your problems didn't get solved the first time. And it's never, ever, ever a good idea to go back to an ex. I know. Mm. So the next one that's on my list here, we've actually talked about recently too. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Resolve to think of others above yourself. And this goes right back to the concept of empathy. Right. And it's something that evangelicals have a really, really hard time with. And coming out of this thing, it might be difficult for you to look beyond the tip of your nose in a lot of situations. And, you know, that's okay as long as you recognize that this is what's happening and that you need to kind of shift your focus a little bit because the more you start thinking in a humanistic way, the more humans start mattering to you. And that's a place where you want your head to be. And just resolving to think about the other person and their experiences and the things that are going on in their lives before you judge them too harshly for things that you see them do or things that you hear them say or a couple lines of text in a social media post. Think about the fact that A, you don't know this person from Adam and B, you don't know what their situation is. That doesn't excuse every bad behavior out there. And I'm not talking really about excusing it. I'm talking about understanding. Understanding is the most important thing. Understand the whys. And that's why I do so many of our episodes from that perspective. Understand the whys right. of how people are, the things that they do, the way that they treat each other, the way that they treat you. And you start understanding how important it is to think beyond the tip of your nose. And I think that that's something that we can all stand to do a little bit more of, whether we're new atheists, lifetime atheists, or anything in between. It's something that I think that you can't learn well enough and you can't implement well enough. So start thinking on a more humanistic level this year. On the heels of that, resolve to let other people be themselves in front of you. This one is particularly difficult for ex-evangelicals mm -hmm. because you've been in this mindset of conformity for so long that even once you get out, you're going to find people who are not necessarily Christians, but who still disagree with a lot of the things that you have to say. You know how many times I hear, well, I don't believe in God, but I'm still spiritual. Yeah. When I finally walked away from Wicca, I walked away from all things spiritual too. Mm -hmm. And it's a very head clearing thing when you stop taking all this extraneous crap and trying to make it real right. because that's what anything spiritual is. It's extraneous crap that your brain latches onto because you have an imagination and you want to use it. Right. And you know, it's time to start thinking a little bit more realistically. There are better ways of using your imagination, yeah. you know, write a poem, write a song, write a book, paint something, draw something engage in some kind of a hobby that defines you that you actually have the opportunity to create something use your imagination that way you don't have to use it constructing fake worlds inside your head right you know unless you're actually going to put them down on paper if you're jrr tolkien then yes construct a fake world in your head it worked really well for him yeah but not so that you can get through this thing called life because you need to learn how to do that by yourself and you need to learn how to lean on other people when you need help because that's where the help is going to come from. It's not going to come from any kind of spiritual anything. So definitely look at things from, from that perspective. But when you're dealing with other people, allow them to be themselves. Don't come at them with both guns blazing even when you know that they're wrong. It's not going to change their mind. It's just going to firm their resolve. Let them figure out things on their own. 
It's the most important thing that I think that we can learn to do as new atheists is allowing people the opportunity to learn things on their own. It's difficult. We want to butt in. We want to have our opinions heard and we want to change their minds because that's what we've been taught is the right thing to do is to get in there and change somebody's mind mm. and get them to accept Jesus. Now it becomes change their mind and get them to accept your way of thinking about this. Well, you know, mm. that's not your job. Yeah. That's just not your job. Let people live the lives that they're going to live in front of you. We talked about learning to think for yourself. So again, real quick, resolve to form your own opinions about everything. Demand proof or at least arguments that are compelling and based upon observable truths before you decide you're going to quote unquote believe anything. I don't think that it's healthy or rational to quote unquote believe in anything. Always demand proof mm. and come up with your own ideas and thoughts that are based on things that you learn, not what you feel. And again, we just did a whole episode on that, so I'm going to leave that one right there. Another thing that I took away from Wicca, which I find to be really, really useful in everyday life, is listening to my own intuition. So this year, resolve to listen to yourself. If something seems off, if something seems not right, or if it seems really, really, really right, chances are you're right. And it's not 100%. Of course not. It's not a guarantee, but if something seems off, it probably is. If something seems good and worth pursuing, it probably is. But with all things, time will tell. I mean, if you get a really, really bad vibe off of something, then steer clear. But also don't get down on yourself if you're wrong once in a while, because intuition is not an exact science. No. It's something that we learn and hone over time, and part of that process is being wrong once in a while, too. But most of the time, if it feels right, it's probably right. If it feels wrong, it's probably wrong, and you should definitely explore those emotions and the thing that surrounds the, the emotions that you're feeling over it at the time. I think that it's very important to get into the habit of doing that. I think this really goes right back to the whole new year, no me concept. Resolve to like yourself more. Yeah. Resolve to like the image that's in the mirror. One of the toughest things for me and VN, and we talked about this, was when they passed the mirror around and you had to look at yourself for 30 seconds straight. Yeah. Because back then I didn't like myself very much and I was taught to not like myself very much. Resolve to like yourself more. Forget everything that you've learned about your righteousness being as filthy rags. Forget about dying to yourself. These things only serve to kill your self-esteem. That's all they're going to do. They're going to rob you of that sense of self. Slap those thoughts away and tell yourself that you know better. Okay? Tell yourself that you're better than what your pastor wanted you to think you were. I mean, your pastor will tell you that he loves you, but then he's going to preach a sermon on your righteousness being as filthy rags and how you have to decrease so that Christ can increase because somehow you're just not good enough to live your life on your own. You need a deity to live it for you. Bullshit. You don't. Just get that out of your head and resolve to be comfortable in your own skin and to like the person that you are. And if that's difficult for you to do, maybe explore some of the reasons why, because there could be reasons why I'm there sure. could be things that need adjusting. There could be thought processes that need redirecting. You may need to get into counseling or therapy. There are ways that you can get past that part of it and start appreciating, liking, and even loving yourself more. These things are very important. Oh, yeah. And if you haven't really looked at it from that perspective, or you haven't really had the courage to start looking at yourself in that way, this is your year. Resolve this year to start liking yourself just a little bit more. Again, we did a whole episode on this, so real quick, resolve to becoming okay with your own mortality. Face it, kids, we're all going to die. It's going to happen, so just deal with it. But here's the thing. It hasn't happened yet, so let's not forget that. Don't forget to enjoy the party. And I don't remember if I brought this one up in that episode or not, but it's the whole concept of, you know, once you figure out that you only have this one life that we are aware of, 
and there's been no one to come back from the other side to tell us definitively that there is anything else. So we have to operate under the assumption that this life is all we're going to get. So look at it in terms of your life being a party. Okay. Now, when you arrive at the party, do you immediately start lamenting that it's eventually going to be over? Or do you take that time and just enjoy the surroundings and the people in the atmosphere? Yeah. You're not going to walk in that door and start grieving because it's going to be over soon. No, you enjoy the party. Well, guess what? Your life is the exact same thing. Your life, it may not be a party in terms of things being easy and things always going your way and you always being happy, but from the perspective of life in general, I think that most people out there, and I know that there are exceptions, but I think that most people out there at the end of it all are glad that they had the opportunity, even if their life was hard, even if they faced struggles, they appreciate what they got out of it. Most people appreciate what they get out of life. And if you're not one of those people and you're spiraling down into a dark path where you don't think that your life is worth anything, especially coming out of religion, because that can take a lot of yourself when you, when you figure out that it's bunk and now you don't know what to do with yourself anymore. I'll put out another appeal to seek out some competent therapy, counseling, secular counseling, please, and deal with that because you only get the one life that we're aware of and it's high time that you started enjoying it and not focusing on the fact that it's going to be over, but reveling in the fact that you have it right now. It's important. Here's one that touches me personally, and I I did touch on it a little bit earlier. So um, just a couple of quick words on this one. Resolve to forgive yourself for steering others into evangelical faith. If you were one of these gung-ho born-agains who was out there converting people left and right and now you're sitting there thinking oh my goodness what in the world did i do to these people well again just like my friend the missionary they all had their own choices to make and the influence that you had over them was probably very small in comparison to the arsenal that was thrown at them to make them make that decision in the first place you know i blame myself for my grandmother being born again. But it wasn't me and my influence that did that. It was her going and watching that drama and being scared to God. Yeah, That's what did it. So it had a lot less to do with me than I like to admit or like to give myself a break over. Mm -hmm. So you know what? If you are one of these that brought a lot of people into this, give yourself a break. Okay, you were doing what you thought was right at the time. And it's just like I talked about way back in episode one. You know, the people who were in our lives and got us involved in this and kept us involved in it, they were products of a much bigger system. And most of them were trained up that this is the way that they should approach their faith from a very, very young age. So don't beat yourself up for being obedient to the tenets of your faith. It just means that it meant something to you at the time. If it helps, then try channeling those energies into something else like what we're doing on this podcast, because I consider, I consider what I'm doing here to be very cathartic and it's helping me along my path of self-forgiveness for getting people like my grandmother involved in this. And I'm learning progressively how to forgive myself for it, but I understand that it sucks to think about because I have to think about it too. But this year, resolve to forgive yourself or at least get on a path of self-forgiveness and just understand that those people had their own choices to make and they made choices that were based on things that weren't necessarily rooted and built up on your particular influence. There was something about the religion and what it offered that appealed to them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have bought the product. Yeah, It's that simple. Finally, on my list for new atheists, resolve to forgive yourself for denying your kids a normal childhood or adolescence if that was you, okay? Fortunately, I got my head screwed on a little bit straighter when our son was young and allowed him to do certain things and to have certain experiences. And by the time he was a teenager, we were, we were kind of on our way 
out. Right. Oh, yeah. So fortunately, I didn't pull Liam's adolescence out from under him. I was perfectly okay with whatever he wanted to experience and what, whatever he wanted to do. And, you know, it, we, our situation is unique because he's unique. But I know that there are a lot of people out there who have made these kinds of decisions and choices when it came to their kids. And now you've seen the light and you understand just what kind of a big deal all this stuff wasn't. But that still leaves them with never having experienced certain things. Well, you know what? A lot of us were deprived a lot of normalcy because of this, and we all got through it. The idea here is that now you are able to loosen those reins or remove those reins and allow them to be individuals. Don't look backwards. Don't look back at the decisions that you made and beat yourself up for them. Just be happy that you learned better and that now you have the opportunity to allow your kids to grow and evolve and become the people that they're meant to be, not what your religion wanted them to be. It's very important because that, I think, also has a major cathartic effect is being able to watch what they do when those reins are removed. I think that it's very liberating for everyone involved, for that person and for you, because now you can feel a little bit better about the things that happened or the things that you held them back from, because now they're discovering themselves and they're making their own decisions and you actually get to know the person that they are, not what the church was shaping them into. Right. This is a much shorter list that I have for evangelicals. But I do want to talk directly to the evangelicals that listen to this show, because I know that there are a few. And this is not going to be anywhere near as confrontational as last week was. So I'll make that disclaimer. Just a discussion and things for you to think about. And, you know, I think that sometimes it takes someone turning the mirror around and making you look at yourself and the way that you think about things to give you a little bit more of a perspective on why you should maybe sort of kind of look at a few other points of view. So I'm going to go through this list just a little bit more quickly and just give you a few ideas for some resolutions that you should be making this year. So for the evangelicals in the audience, number one, resolve to become educated about just one area of science. And I'm not talking necessarily about evolution or any of the things that create climates of debate, but just start looking at science from a perspective where it's not the enemy. Right. Look at it as I'm going to learn something here. If there's been something that you've been interested in, whether it's astronomy or some area of biology or whatever it may be, just learn a little something about it this year. I'm not saying take a college course, but read a book, find some meaningful content. And you can tell the difference between what's meaningful and what's fluff. You know, just zero in on one area of science and learn something about it. And I think that you're going to find that it's not this evil, sinister thing that's trying to take away your faith. And I think that you'll find that there's a lot more truth in it than you give it credit for. And honestly, that's not your fault. You've been taught that science is the enemy. It isn't. Yeah. And you can figure that out on your own just Take some time to learn something that's like a hard science this year. Resolve to learn more about American politics because I think the more that you understand that, the more you'll understand the shit show that you've just been put through and you'll understand precisely why so many of your evangelical cohorts are still clinging to this irrational belief that the president of the United States on January 20th of next year is going to be anyone but Joe Biden. Yeah. I think that you'll start understanding where some of these thoughts come from, especially if you are a Republican. Look at the history of the Republican Party and see how it's changed over time. And I think that you'll recognize and understand that things have not changed for the better and that these are not ideals that you really want to align yourself with, even as an even especially as an evangelical, because so much of it goes counter to what you believe about your faith and about your God. And the more that you learn and the more that you start paying attention to, I think the easier it's going to be for you to start understanding just how much wool has been pulled over your eyes with this. Here's a, 
a neat one for you. Resolve to read the Old Testament as if Yahweh was your actual father. I said this way back in episode two, get to know your daddy. But I think that if you start reading the Bible from the perspective of this is my father, not my heavenly father, my literal father. And if he was like this, would it be even possible to love him? And would I be able to believe that he loved me? Oh, and I'll say it again. Search and search and search all you want. You'll never find a single verse where he says that he loves you. Yeah. It's that simple. Resolve to volunteer at a secular charity. See what it's like to care about people without the agenda of proselytizing them, being right. part of the equation. See what it's like to just do something good for the sake of doing something good. And I think that you'll start recognizing the value and the benefit of that over just, okay, you want a bowl of soup? Well, you have to listen to the sermon first. No. Volunteer at a secular charity. Get involved with something, even if it's just for a weekend or something that you do, you know, just a couple of times to get exposure to it. And I think that you'll understand the benefit of taking God out of the equation and just being in a position of watching and being a part of people helping people. I think that that's something that a lot of evangelicals don't really get exposure to and are even discouraged from being involved in. But if you just take the time to understand how the other half does this thing called charity, I think that you're going to, you're going to also understand just how much more good it does when you take God out of the equation. Resolve to learn about alternative lifestyles. I'm not saying adopt. I'm just saying understand. Because right. if you want to claim that you understand what empathy is, then you need to understand people. And you need to have the desire to understand people. You do not have to become gay. You do not have to become trans. You do not have to engage in things that make you feel uncomfortable thinking about them. But understand that this is what people are. These are the things that make them the people who they are. Right. And it's important to understand that there's a real diversity out there among people. And when you start understanding that, you'll start understanding how crazy it is to think that the entire world should ad adhere to one religion because most of the world can't wrap their brains around Christianity. It's a lost cause. And once you start understanding the way other people think and the reasons why they live the way that they live, I think that you'll start understanding a little bit better how futile it is to think that there's a religion out there that's for everybody, that can save everybody, that is the answer to all of the world's problems and questions. It doesn't exist. And learning more about people and the way that they live, I think, will really put a period on that thought for you. Resolve to stop equating moral character with what happens in someone's bedroom, because it feels to me like a good 90 plus percent of the way that people are judged in evangelical circles has to do with the way that they manage their sexuality. And we need to start moving away from that mindset. We need to start understanding that what happens in someone else's bedroom is none of our business and that that's them and that it doesn't affect us. So we really shouldn't be worrying about it. Pure and simple. Resolve to truly, honestly, and outwardly love your neighbor as yourself. And what this means, it's not just about putting on a mask. It's about recognizing how your actions affect other people. I'm not going to go back into the COVID realm with this because there are so many other things in right. life that this applies to that I don't think I need to go through a big list or litany. I think you understand what this means. It's in your book. It's something that you've been told to do. It's something that you need to start taking seriously and putting into practice. A couple more quick ones here. Resolve to broaden your understanding of right and wrong and ask yourself if doing the right thing would still matter without the promise of reward or threat of punishment after you die. Start thinking about just doing the right thing because it's right. And start thinking about whether or not some of these things that you think are wrong are wrong because they're wrong or wrong because you don't like them or you've been taught to fear them or dislike them or look at them as sinful because there's a big difference there. And just ask yourself, would you still live an upright life by a good set of morals even if you knew you would never see heaven? If the answer is yes, then guess what? You don't need 
a God or a religious system to do your thinking for you, and you don't need it to make you a good person. It's that simple. Resolve to explore questions that you have about what the Bible says when you think something might be a little off. Do your research. Ask questions. Sure, ask your pastor and see how he reacts. If he recoils and gets angry, that's usually a red flag that something is wrong, yeah. and it means that he doesn't have the answers to your questions, and now he's feeling trapped because he doesn't have an answer for you. And those moments are very, very, very telling. At least I can say that I moved in circles where if I asked my any of my pastors, really, right. but particularly my youth pastor, if I asked something that he didn't have an immediate answer to, he didn't bullshit me. He said, well, you know what? I'm not really sure about that. It's maybe something that you should pray about and seek some help from the source about was the way that he would he would put it to me. Right. So I was lucky in that regard, but a lot of people out there aren't so lucky. And you will get bullshit answers from your pastor and from the person sitting next to you in the pew and anyone who just simply wants you to think the way that they do. You'll get some real bullshit answers from them. I said this a long time ago too, and I'm going to put out the challenge. Resolve to stop going to church just for one month. Mm -hmm. No Christian TV, no Christian movies, no Christian books, no Christian music, no Christian anything for one month and watch what happens to the way you start thinking. Watch how your rational mind just wakes the fuck up because it will. And it will be an eye opener to you. When you get your brain out of that environment and let it start doing what it's supposed to do without all of those external influences in play all the time, you're going to find that things start to change and they start changing very, very quickly. It's a scary one to think about. And if, if, if the notion of this scares you, then to me, that's all the more reason why you should be doing it. Right. That's all the more reason why you should try it. If it scares you, then it probably means that you're trauma bonded to your religion and that you need to start figuring out a way to get away from your abusive daddy. Right. So just a few more quick words in closing. This is actually a lot of words in closing, but that's okay. It's the only part of this that I, that I scripted out and I really want to get it out there. Just for the last few minutes here, I'm going to talk to everybody and just sort of put a period on the stuff that we've been talking about tonight. The beginning of a new year is not a mandatory starting point for any of the things that we've talked about, but it's at this time of year that the concept of changing and resetting are in the fronts of a lot of people's minds. The concept of a new year's resolution may seem a little cliche. Okay. It's very cliche. So let's just think in terms of resolve for resolve's sake. If that works a little bit better for you, you are doing these things. If you decide to try any of them, you're doing them for you. You're steering your thinking in new directions for you, not for anyone else, for you. You're distancing yourself from toxic people and situations for you. You're exploring a few pleasures of the flesh for you, and you're doing it in a mature, safe, and responsible way. And since I know it still sticks in a lot of our minds that someone is watching or even gives a shit what we do with our lives, let me tell you this much. Those impulses aren't going to go away anytime soon. You just need to stand up to them. Let reason best dogma inside your head. Understand that the only moral compass you will ever possess comes from inside you and that you are capable of making good choices. If you can't, you need to accept those shortcomings and get help managing and sorting through those areas of conflict. Other people will make sure that you know if something is amiss. Take the hints as they come, but be wary of advice and criticisms that come from evangelicals, of course, because they have their own agenda and it usually has little or nothing to do with improving your quality of life. But take those cues and act on them if they seem legit. Also, don't beat yourself up if you aren't able to steer clear of some of the old toxic thought and behavior patterns just now. Remember that this is a process and that it will take time and you can read that as the rest of your life. This is going to take the rest of your life to sort through. Start reading some better books. Start hanging out with people who aren't interested in making you more like them. Hang out with people who want you to be you. Start taking pleasure in certain things that you were once told were sinful because there are so many petty, innocuous things that evangelicals tag with that scarlet S that are victimless and harmless in their execution. 
their God doesn't like it. Well, guess what? Their God doesn't like you either. Otherwise, he'd be present and available and would treat you at least on par with how a loving human parent treats his or her children. All of these things will help start steering your mind in a direction that leads to you being happy with you. And barring any kind of sociopathic tendencies, this is always a good thing. Are you generally kind? Are you generally empathetic? Are you willing to live and let live? Then live your life your way. You already have a healthy and workable framework. And the more you shine the spotlight on you and the less you attribute your ability to live a good life to a fake deity who couldn't even teach you how to do that in the first place, more of your thoughts will shift into places like personal responsibility, empathy, and compassion, all things that your fake God knows nothing about. Now, to our evangelical friends, I'll make this short and sweet. I already know that you've dismissed every word of advice I offered outright, and I understand why. But I challenge you to think about the things that I brought up and ask yourself why you feel such unrest over simply following my lead and trying to implement some of the things that I mentioned. If you're even remotely honest with yourself, you'll say that all aversions to these things inside your head have the same common foundation, and that is fear. Do keep in mind that if you believe in your own book, your God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You have the power to make your own choices. You have the ability to love, and you have the right to a sound mind. Following the leads of televangelists and failed maniacal demagogic wannabe dictators will never get you there. But considering some of the advice I just gave you tonight can... You can't have a sound mind when your brain is addled by fairy tales and conspiracy, or if you refuse to use your mind for the purposes for which it exists, that being to never stop learning and to apply logic and reason to any and all situations. And you will never feel personally empowered as long as you insist on being crucified with Christ and dying to yourself and denying yourself simple things like a good movie, a good drink, or some good sex with someone with whom you aren't under a legal contract. Exclusion and self-denial are a recipe for toxic thought and behavior. If you aren't happy in your faith, insist on getting answers from your God as to why you're holding up your end, and yet you never feel joy or even happiness outside the cloister of your church community, if then. And when those answers don't come, it should be obvious how nonsensical it is to live this particular brand of quiet desperation any longer. To everyone out there, thank you again for listening and supporting all that we do here. Let's do our part to make 2021 the best me year for each of us yet. And let's resolve to learning more about ourselves, experiencing the things that life has to offer, and enjoying the satisfaction of knowing that even though life may never be perfect, it will always be just a little bit happier, more self-affirming, and keep us in a better headspace overall when we resolve to live each and every day unbound. hope you enjoyed this episode of unbound show topics are chosen based on their timeliness relevance and social impact have suggestions for future topics email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback please don't forget to like share and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms and don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website getunbound.org that's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound. Unbound.